<laughs> oh, great. Okay, so here we've got basically the uh, northern hemisphere. Look at the northern hemisphere, um, the distribution of ice masses in the northern hemisphere. And, of course, right here you see Greenland, and up here you see the floating sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And that was about the extent of the floating sea ice at the time this particular graphic was produced back in the 1970s. And it's really not that much different right now if we look at it. You notice there are large portion, portions of open water here, um, but that's yeah. not going to be our subject. But, okay, so this is what basically you see the ice mass distribution in the northern hemisphere um, at present. So the next slide is going to be basically the same view, but looking at the ice masses during the late glacial maximum. And you can see that things were, uh, there was a lot more area of the Northern Hemisphere buried under ice. Notice that the uh, Arctic Ocean is completely choked off with ice. But some interesting things here. Notice Siberia is not glaciated. In fact, there's evidence of an open Arctic Ocean on the Siberian side during the late glacial maximum. Which, is, which, if true, is going to be rather tricky to explain. And it is tricky to explain why this ice mass is not centered symmetrically about the North Pole. It's all lopsided to one side. Do you see that? So you can look over here and you can see that over this area, the ice might have, might have been up to two miles thick. You know, there, there's a, there's a um, couple of different ways of, of modeling how much ice there was. But it would have been at least a mile and a half, according to some calculations, and others maybe up to two miles thick over here, over the, over the summit of the, of the ice sheet. And then, so over here, we've got the Fenoscandian, as it's called, um, because it's buried, basically, you'll notice that it's completely buried uh, Scandinavia. And you'll notice here that this, that this plain, this low plain here, is what is now the North Sea. So this is a, one of the areas that became a, a drowned with the 400-foot rise of sea level as the ice sheets were melting. Let's go to the next one. So this is a view um, at the end of the last ice age. And here you can see the two great ice sheets, the, the Laurentide ice sheet, which was the, the bigger of them, which was basically centered over Hudson Bay. Although most of the models suggest that it formed uh, initially two, there were two nuclei one on the east side, one on the west side of Hudson Bay, those begin to nucleate ice massing around those two spots, and then eventually it coalesced. Um, and so if you look here, here was this was the, one of those nucleation spots, and then the other one was over here. And then over here we have the Cordilleran ice sheet. So it's important to note that there were two distinct ice sheets. And the nature of the connection between these two has always been of interest because it's likely that during the warm period, the Balling Alarod warm period, these ice sheets melted back enough that it opened up a corridor right here between the two ice sheets. And this was basically serving as the, uh, uh, the main idea for how the Western Hemisphere was ultimately populated was that you had, that you had pe people uh, migrating across the Bering Land Bridge up here, and then coming down the, coming down the uh, ice-free corridor. And here's a this showing the distribution of the Fennoscandian ice sheet here. So you can see that here the outline of the, the the British Isles is here, and Scandinavia is up here. The North Sea would be this. So the North Sea was above, basically was was under the ice sheet. Then when the the initial melting occurred. This created, there was a massive lake in this area. And now, of course, it's, it's under, you know, the um, um, English Channel is right here. And the English Channel has evidence of massive scouring. Now, I've seen some of the dates. And the dates for that scouring that I've seen, and I haven't really scrutinized them in detail, suggest that it was an earlier event that created the, the, the Scabland topography on the bottom of the English Channel. However, I'm sure that even if there were earlier events, the melting of the Fennoscandian certainly would have contributed to um, the erosional complex that's now on the bottom of the English Channel. Okay, so now here is a global topographical relief map with the modern day coastlines. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few of these images here to get an idea of what 
land areas were submerged with the rising sea levels. Now, this particular map, if I recall, is showing a, 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 a decreased sea level of 350 feet. I think that was what they were using. Given that at the late glacial maximum was at least 400 feet more, that what that means is that this is a very conservative map when yep. you start looking at what was actually exposed during the LGM or late glacial maximum. So now we'll go from this map to a 350 foot lower sea level. Look up here at the Bering Land Bridge. And you mm. see that the land bridge is actually bigger than the modern state of Alaska. And I've got some more detailed here. So here we can see North America. You'll notice the, sh how the size of the shelf here that separates North America from, from Asia, right? Amer uh, Alaska from Siberia. And then when we drop when we uh, drop sea levels 360 feet, we get that. Wow. So that, that, was a, that was an extremely huge land mass that was densely populated with megafauna during the last ice age, which is really interesting because in order to be densely populated with megafauna, it had to have enough vegetation there for them to eat. You know, when you had the, the great herbivores, there had to be enough vegetation there for them to eat. And, and it had to be it's that's that's wild that like over you know on what's now the continental u.s we had ice coming down to so far south and then over there in alaska and siberia there was no ice and there was flowering plants and stuff that's pretty strange that is pretty strange isn't it well and unfortunately it doesn't show the ice sheet there right. that's the that's the reason yeah. why the sea level is so much lower but <laughs> as as we ended up in the previous episode number 10 you can see that florida's at, at least double its width yeah yeah when you here i'll i'll toggle back oh yeah you see there no hudson bay notice right. the land all these islands up here and in the connection up here northern canada to greenland yeah. That's Pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Then here is, you know, Indochina area. And this is what was called Sunda land. Sundaland. And when I drop sea level 360 feet, you see what happens? Look at how much land area you're check up from, from here all the way down. All of this now becomes exposed. So, you know, we could say we could we could certainly legitimately theorize that there might have been civilization of some kind in this area, because for one thing, this would have been probably likely one of the um, more benign places on the planet to or, order to establish and, and and you know build some kind of a, a of a culture or a civilization. But now you'll see how much of that got drowned. See, notice also this would be during these lowered sea levels is when the emigration to Australia likely took place. Now, Australia was populated at least 50,000 years ago. But what, what I'm saying is that it could have been an earlier glacial cycle that people right. first made it across. And I'm not saying they necessarily were able to walk across because they probably couldn't, but obviously sailing would have been much easier if you've only got to go 10 or 20 miles between islands. See? Right. Yeah. So, so then, uh, yeah, and here, here's Northwestern Europe. And you'll see Scandinavia and the British Isles. Now we're going to drop sea level 360 feet. Randall, I, I think I gave the copy of National Geographic to you. It talked about uh, archaeologists were surprised to find that, that fish trawlers were digging, were bringing up artifacts from that area where the North yeah. is now. They, it completely surprised the archaeologists and according to this article that wow there were people there imagine that yeah well over and over and over again how many decades have i been saying you know that we're really a lot of the um important and critical archaeological finds in the next few decades are going to be is you know marine archaeology yeah. because literally during the ice ages when sea levels were lowered being on the coastlines is most likely the the uh, most uh benevolent place to to put down well, it's, it, it's it's still where the majority of the human population lives now is along sea coast, right. and, sea coast and waterways yes exactly and when you realize that that sea level rise was not really a smooth process but you know there were these 
interruptions, the CREs that I mentioned earlier, the catastrophic rise events, means people would have had to uproot and move inland quite quickly. So, yeah, this gives folks an idea of the um, how vast these changes were. So the, the total uh, cumulative amount of ice that was packed in over North America and including that Finno-Scandian is estimated at six to seven million cubic miles. Yeah. Right, which is fairly, you know, close equivalent to what's covering Antarctica today. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the kind of amount of ice that's got to melt to raise sea level, you know, nearly 400 feet. Like, like you explained before, you know, you look a mile that way and a mile that way and then a mile up okay, you got a mile of cubic ice and then multiply that by 6 million, it's just, you know, it's hard to comprehend uh, that, that that's what was on the, on the landscape and, and is now in the ocean. Yeah. And, how, and, and what happens to, to create that change? Some, somehow that much ice has got to transform into water and then get in the ocean basins. Uh, and and there, there's, there's no normal process on the earth that uh, we typically see in modern history that's going to explain that. So there's got to be some, as you, again, spoke recently about the outrageous hypotheses. You know, you got to think outrageously sometimes about these processes on the earth that, that transpire to, to create these sudden changes.